I'm really sorry if you didn't come. Uh, getting ready to preach on it soon. Be leg two of our theme for the year. But we're going to have to, we're going to have to uh, stretch ourselves a little bit as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Are we out of papers? Did we run out? Did we run out of papers? You got some more? Did anybody not get a paper? Uh, Sister Callie didn't get one. Brother McKinney didn't get one. We need two on the front row. Sister Jessica didn't get one. Up here, Sister Jessica needs one. Um. Did anybody else need one? Brother McKinney, do we have another? Trey, did you get one for yourself? Okay. All right. All right. I do have one more in the back. My master copy's in the back. Uh, I can make more. Uh, I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to keep on making them. Amen. We uh, we mess around, have to cut a tree down every Wednesday night. Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. Amen. Wonderful. Um, if if you weren't here last night, not only did you miss out on uh, did you miss out on uh, a ton of good information. Meet a great guy. Didn't y'all love Pastor Lyndon? Wasn't he a, just an incredible, credible gentleman? And uh, he is a, a very, very charismatic individual. And uh, I, uh, uh, I had the good fortune to, to eat lunch with him again today, and uh, uh, along with Brother Lovell and Brother McDougal, and we went to Lambert's, and uh, uh, that we had a waitress. If you're ever there and you want a really good waitress, ask for a lady named Maxine. She is amazing. She is amazing. And she brought us uh, uh, a hog jaw and catfish as appetizers just because she wanted to. And uh, uh, she brought us all kinds of stuff. So he got indoctrinated into Lambert's. He'd never eaten a pork steak before. And uh, he'd never had sorghum molasses before. And he fell in love with that. He ate about three rolls with sorghum piled all over the top of them. And uh, uh, so, uh, but he told us something. Now, I, I, I don't know how long I'm going to keep you tonight because I'm just going to lay a foundation. All right, I'm going to lay a foundation. Everybody knows uh, I had somebody <laughs> I had somebody this weekend tell me, uh, maybe it wasn't this weekend. What is today? No, it wasn't this weekend. So earlier this week, they told me, we're going to start coming to your church, but there ain't nobody going to mind that we ain't Pentecost. And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I don't care what you call yourself. You come on to church. But I've been preaching something around here for the last couple of years. And Pastor Lyndon told us today, the way that, the way that uh, he received the revelation that he did was, uh, and he told his testimony, and I, I won't tell it all tonight because uh, that's not mine to tell. But uh, it was in a very low-key way. It had to do with a song. And, and the, the apostolic guys all went silent on the end of the song. And uh, he, he began to immediately ask questions. And he told us today, he said, If that would have arisen in my life in any other manner, I would not have listened to it. He said, If somebody would have been trying to force it at me, if somebody, he said, You guys were gentlemen. He said, And... When it went silent on the end of that song, he said, uh, immediately something just got a hold of me. And I said all that to say this, what I'm going to teach tonight, and we're going to begin to delve into things that have been somewhat controversial as, uh, for, as far as the apostolic Pentecostal church goes. But I was amazed to sit back and watch the Holy Ghost work. 
if we will get out of the way and trust God, he'll do what he can do. He will reveal truth. He will reveal greater truth. He will reveal holiness. He will reveal righteousness. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. I was amazed at watching. Not only did the Holy Ghost work, but the Holy Ghost worked in a powerful way. He was able to articulate that in, in a, just an amazing, it's called revelation. And it was beautiful. And I was glad to be a part of it. And uh, excited about what's coming down the road. It's important that you realize and recognize you have got to allow the Holy Ghost to work in your life. The Holy Ghost works in your life. Amen? It's very important that these are biblical principles that we're going to teach. They're not a list of rules and regulations. We're not trying to be mean or restrictive. But simply... Trying to maintain the created distinction. Everybody say created distinction between the sexes. Now remember, if you disagree or you don't understand or it rubs you the wrong way, don't stop coming to church. Keep on coming to church. Come worship with us. Love God with us. Be a part of this church in every way. There are and there will be more limitations with regard to leadership and, and platform participation. But we're going to keep in mind that any new worshiper is going to be given an opportunity to grow. Amen? Any new worshiper, they're babies. Anybody that's just starting out with God is a babe in Christ, and they have to have an opportunity to grow. They have to. If you're going to find out as we go forward in this that uh, many areas of what we call holiness issues are in fact not holiness issues at all. But they're spiritual maturity issues. As you grow closer to the Lord, there's going to be more and more worldly things in your life that are no longer comfortable. As you grow in the Lord and as you grow in being, and, and this, this is something that we've got to grasp a hold of. The Bible said he has placed all the members in the body as it has pleased him. Okay, you have a work to do. I have a work to do. We have a responsibility. We have an obligation. And one of the reasons why people get hung up on holiness is they do not recognize and realize that God's got something great for them. They get hung up right here and never go on past it. There are things that people are going to get upset about or maybe question or, or, or it's going to cause them some, some degree of uh, anxiety that, that never even enters into my mind. Not that I'm better than anybody else, that's, that's not the point. But the point is, is when you begin to walk in the fulfillment and the will of what God has for you, there are some things that you're not going to want to waste your time quibbling about. Many areas of what we call holiness are fact spiritual maturity issues. Or sanctification issues which is the work of separation that the Holy Ghost does. But when we refuse to grow, and the way that we refuse to grow is we refuse to be obedient to Scripture, we refuse to be led by the Holy Ghost, when we refuse to be led by the Spirit, then our lack of obedience becomes an issue of salvation. Did that make sense? Many of these areas and things we're going to talk about are, are spiritual maturity issues. But when you say, I don't like that, I'm going somewhere else, then it has become a salvation issue. Because you will be a for sure sign of the end time when you begin to try to find a preacher that will scratch your itchy ears. That's what the book says. They will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It's a sign of the end time. 
Nobody is going to be on that potter's wheel and nobody is going to be made into a vessel that seems good to the potter without it costing you a little bit of something, without there being a little bit of pressure, without there being a crossroads that you're going to come to where you're going to have to make some decisions and say, I will follow Jesus. You cannot refuse to grow. Because if you're not growing, you're dying. Let's look at this directive given from Paul to Timothy. You have it on your paper in the NIV. I'm going to read it first in the King James Version and then in the New International Version. But this is Paul giving a directive to Timothy regarding how he should approach spiritual growth or maturity in those to whom he would minister. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 through 26. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure, perhaps, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Notice the NIV. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That is the hope. That is the plan. And if you act like anything less than a gentleman or a lady, and you are ridic- you ridicule, you are ugly, you, you, you act like people are ignorant, then you will do just the opposite to win them. You will run them off. Is my microphone on? Because it ain't, it ain't like it ain't working too good or something. And that they will come to their senses. Do you realize that the avenue by which the devil moves and operates in anyone's life, there are not many people that are under a supernatural attack from the enemy, Brother Pete, but the way that he operates in our life is through our lifestyle choices. There are not many people that have imps and angels and demons coming into their house uh, that, are, that are separating them from God. It is our choices of lifestyle that lead us into a place uh, where we become separated from God because we are now serving the flesh rather than the spirit. We have dealt with holiness of the mind several weeks and then holiness of speech for the last two weeks. Brother David did a good job both from the mouth and otherwise. These two areas are pretty safe to cover. But I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I'm going to go there. I'm going to rattle your cage. We taught it. I, I, don't, I didn't look see how many weeks. I think, I think, Brother David, holiness of the mind and holiness of speech has been about six weeks. Six solid weeks of teaching on Wednesday nights. And there are some of us under the sound of my voice that didn't learn anything. Brother, you may have to crank me up a little bit. You say, well, I'm just teasing. You say, well, and, and, and we're, we're, we're going to lay a foundation tonight. We're going to lay a foundation. Maybe, maybe 35 or 40 years ago, the things that I'm going to teach may have been somewhat debatable. But with the, with the sinful immorality that is rising up in our world even daily, I would grant you, I didn't have the opportunity today, but I would grant you that if you fired your internet up and your homepage rose up, that there was something across that page got to do with the word transgender. I would venture to guess that it's there. It's in the news virtually every day. Something about people getting to decide if they're a boy or a girl. As if it... it, think, Think about it just for a minute, for goodness sakes. 
as if it's a matter of choice in the first place. How long is it going to be before when they turn five, they get to go meet a psychiatrist who lets them decide if they want to live with this family or they want to find a new one? It's not much different. How, how much longer before abortion's not the problem anymore and they let them be born and if they've got the, got the right color hair, the right color eyes, uh, we'll take them out and kill them for you and get you ready for another one. It's not much different. But the principles of the apostolic church with regard to holiness and separation from the world are more applicable and more necessary today than they have ever been. In the face of a world that is trying its best to eradicate the, the plan of God, the mind of God, and the work of God on a daily basis, uh, they're snubbing their nose at God Almighty. The church has got to stand up uh, and begin to more than ever practice what we preach. Amen. Nothing that I cover from here on out is going to do you any good. If you didn't get holiness of the mind and holiness of the mouth and the fingers down pat. So I'm telling you, it ain't cute no more. It ain't cute. Nobody's saying, well, that's just the way they are. If you cannot conform, and I feel the Holy Ghost right now. If you cannot conform to the Word of God with regard to, to the way you behave from, from your mind that flows primarily out through your mouth or your fingers, then get rid of your internet, cut off your Facebook, your Twitter, and all those other things, and shut your cotton-picking mouth. Say, well, my goodness, man, you're just being all kinds of ugly. That can't compare to some of the stuff that comes out of our folks' mouths sometimes. I'm not, I'm not on no, I got no axe to grind and I'm not angry and I'm not mad. But I'm telling you that if we don't start being apostolic church, our big, it, it ain't going to be britches and hair that's going to be our problem. You want us to preach on that. You want us to talk about that. And when somebody's hemline rides up a little bit too much, uh, you want to gripe and bellyache and moan about it. Uh, we got to get rid of our stinking attitudes uh, and our ignorant mouth uh, before we even need to worry about this. And I'm telling you, it's a problem. It's a problem. First time somebody looks at you cockeyed and you want to spread it all over Facebook, you need to be smacked. I did say that. I, I don't. I don't. I don't have an axe to grind. But the devil makes me so mad because he don't have to even be very slick to deceive some of us until we're more than ready to jump in with both feet and help him one hundred percent. Somebody comes to church that you don't like and you can't keep your mouth shut and say something nice, you sit as far away from them as you can. And as soon as the altar call is given, you come to the altar and repent of your sins. <laughs> Woo! We can cover holiness of the mind, holiness of the mouth. Without anything else, without getting those down pat. You, you're nothing but a Pharisee. If you, if, you, if you do the things we preach, teach, and believe on the outside, and you're not changed on the inside, you're the same as a Pharisee. With that being said, let me take a deep breath right now. I forgot to look around to see if there was anybody that could whoop me. With that being said, we're going to now approach the outward areas of holiness. Seeing that what's on the outside is a reflection of what's going on on the inside of us. 
Now, some of this teaching has been gleaned from Pastor Raymond Woodward's teachings, and I encourage you to Google Raymond Woodward and, and read. He puts all of his Bible studies, all of his notes. You can watch him teach it. Uh, it's incredible teaching, preaching. I encourage you to get on there and look at it. He, he's got them ready for you to print out, every bit of them. It's great. And a large part of it also from Pastor Rodney Shaw, who pastors New Life of Austin. The number one thing we've got to recognize and realize is, and I, I want you to understand this again before I go any further. I'm not going to deal with any particular issue tonight as much as I'm going to lay a foundation of why there even is an issue. All right? God created male first. I don't know how long he was there by himself. But God recognized that it was not good that man be alone. And so then he created female. It's so important. Pastor Lyndon talked about it last night. He didn't call it this, but it's the law of first mention in the Bible. When you find something in the Bible the first time it is mentioned, it is establishing a principle for the rest of the Bible. And it is important for us to go back to the beginning. We're not smart enough, rich enough, talented enough, or pretty enough uh, to try to change the things of God without going and finding out what was His purpose in the first place. It's important to go to the beginning to find the attention of God. Because you see, we are striving, trying with His help, His grace, and His mercy to return to the same relationship that Adam and Eve had in the garden before there was sin. That's where we're trying to get back to is that, that restored relationship as it was in the beginning. Now I'm going to give you, I, I said this last year, didn't preach about it, talk about it. I just want you to think about it. Other than being naked... What do you think Eve looked like? Other than being naked. And I don't want you to think about no naked woman running around the Garden of Eden. And about 12 people just right then said, too late. There's a prevailing thought in society today. I first heard it a couple of years ago when I believe it was in London, England. A, par a set of parents... A set of parents that was a man and a woman. And they still ain't come up with a way for you to produce a child without there being a man and a woman involved somewhere. But when a man and a woman that had a baby and dressed him in, dressed it in basically toe sacks, I mean, like uh, completely neutral clothes. And they came on the news and they were being lauded by the news because they had decided to not cut the child's hair, to not dress him in any particular color or particular style, but to allow them to choose when they got to age if they wanted to be a male or if they, excuse me, wanted to be a female. A couple of years ago it came out. Now it's something that's happening all the time. But there's a prevailing thought in society today that the reason why that, that I identify, and, and it almost makes me sick to say that, that I identify, I don't ever remember making a decision to be a boy. I was boy from Jump Street. But there's a prevailing thought in society today that the reason why that I say I was a boy and now I'm a man is because that's what my mom and daddy taught me to do. That our gender identity is socially constructed by our parents rather than biologically. Gender identity is referred to as what a person identifies with without regard to physical makeup. The church has to send a clear signal that emphatically declares. Hear me now, and I don't want to get too excited. The church has to send a clear signal that emphatically declares that there is a difference between male and female and that God created and determined your gender. Right. Amen. And we have 
to do that in every area possible. And I would submit, Brother David, that we have to search for more ways to make the line more clear rather than more blurred. Did that make sense? Do y'all say amen on this side sometimes? Let's try it. Everybody all at once. One, two, ready, go. There we go. Because it seems like I only hear it from that side. Mainly because I'm standing over there most of the time. There must be more heathens on that side than there are on this side. Genesis 1 and 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, my Lord Jesus. Do you see? Do you see how? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. We were made in the image and likeness of God. Humanity reflects the image of God. Because the image of God is more moral image of God. Love, righteous integrity rather than physical. But it was a physical image of God. Through Jesus Christ when he said Genesis 1 and 26, let us make man in our own image. The only human image of God is Jesus Christ. Humanity most reflects the image of God when it is fully masculine and fully feminine. Because it is then when we stay within the boundaries and order of creation. Now understand that there are... Are, are y'all going to get to everything else I've taught after I had to do, use a little shock and awe there at the beginning? Huh? I ain't never going to be no sissy preacher. If you want a sissy preacher, you need to go somewhere else. I ain't never going to be a sissy preacher. I'm not preaching from anger. I'm preaching from frustration because you have got to get this stuff. Let me say this. You have got to get this stuff if you want to be saved. We have got to grow and become more like Jesus Christ and less like this world that we live in. And anybody that aspires to the Christian ethic and wants to find ways, Sister Maria, to be more like the world, they ain't got the Holy Ghost that I got. Say, well, there you go puffing yourself up again. No, 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 no. I'm telling you that with Sister Jamie, when I start getting offline a little bit, the Holy Ghost slaps me upside the head and says, get yourself back over there where you belong. It ain't nothing about me. It's about that I need Him. Every day, every hour, every situation, every crossroads I come to, I need the Holy Ghost. I don't want Him to leave me. I don't want Him to forsake me. Not to keep the enemy away from me, but to keep me on the right track. I need Him not just to heal my kids. I need Him not just to make sure there's money in the bank. Not just make sure i got a car to drive and a house to live in. I need Him to keep me on the right track. There are unique, everybody say unique, unique. and complementary roles for men and women. You know, I, I remember when I was in college. And, and again, nothing I say, it's all going out there on the internet. I keep waiting. Every time I get a phone call that I don't recognize where it comes from, I keep waiting for the ACLU or the somebody to be on the phone telling me I said something crazy that they want to sue me over. But I remember when I was in college and, and we had to give speeches and uh, uh, I remember the, the, the line of thinking back then and maybe it was right at the very end of me being in high school when, uh, when, when the deal came out with women, this is going to really, really date me, but it's also going to really sound crazy, especially in the world we live in now where everything's just all mixed up. But it was when women first started trying to sue to be able to be in combat. How many of y'all remember that? How many of you remember that? And I remember somebody, and it was a lady, uh, 
It was a lady, and it was all in the news, man, and it was like a big deal. Do, do y'all even remember that? There was a time when women could not go be in combat, and it was in, been in my lifetime. I, I remember it well when it happened. And, and there was a lady that stood up and gave a talk, and, and, and she said something that was, you know, it was in the news, and it was in the courts, and, and if you want to go be in combat, that's your business. But there, there, she was, And she said something to the effect, you do know that women ain't lining up to get to go be in combat. That this is a, a matter of like two or three different people that act like they're speaking for everybody. It's almost like the Jerry Clower story when he said, I want you to hush because mama don't want nobody messing with the deal she's got. Y'all remember that? She said that people get out here, there ain't too many women wanting to be on the front lines. <laughs> 